या देवी सर्वूदेशु दयारूपेण संसिदा नमस्त 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 नमो नम ओ गॉडेस इन द फॉर्म ऑफ कंपैशन हु रिसाइड्स इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ एवरी क्रीचर टू दी आई बाव अगेन अगेन एंड यश अगेन या देवी सर्वूदेशु मातृपेण संसिद नमस्त 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 नमो नम ओ गॉडेस हु इन द फॉर्म ऑफ मदर रिसाइड्स इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ एवरी क्रीचर टू दी आई बाव अगेन एंड अगेन एंड यश अगेन I make my obeisance to all these ladies who are here in the form of mother in the form of sisters in the form of daughters and aunts and friends I make my obeisance to all of you this wonderful morning hari om that's it the sanatan dharma is the only religion that worships god as both male and female worship of god as mother has fascinated the minds of all people at all times since the mother is one with whom everyone can have an intimate relationship in fact this is the primary relationship the devotee has greater freedom when he conceives of god as mother the great sage of bengal shri ramakrishna said just as a child can force its demands on his mother so a devotee can force his demands on god as mother the first word uttered by the infant is ma our first relationship with the world is through the mother the earliest memory of any person of is of lying on his mother's lap and gazing into her love filled eyes in the mother is centered the whole world of tenderness love nourishment and care she is the embodiment of security she personifies the ideal of unconditional love from which the child draws sustenance comfort protection and nourishment to transfer this concept to a cosmic being was a natural step which all ancient civilizations took therefore we can understand that the concept of the divine as a mother is as old as life itself the ancients were nurtured by the milk of kindness which is always oozing from the breast of our divine mother and that is why they had a sense of the high purpose of human life but this age seems to have forgotten her very existence this is the dark age kali yuga in which our increasing engrossment with the physical side of life has torn us away from the metaphysical roots and alienated us from our divine mother man is a child of the universe an infant tied by the umbilical cord of space and time to that great nurturing mystery out of which we have been born and to which we will inevitably return it is only natural to think of the divine as the cosmic mother who loves all nourishes all cares and protects all she is the divine mother the eternal womb of all creatures human animal and subhuman she cradles her children in her loving arms suckles them and nurtures them with her infinite love in all its forms wherever you see a maternal love in a bird feeding her uh, her a little chicks or an animal or a human being know that to be but an aspect of her love for the universe for she is a universal mother our dependence on that mysterious mother is absolute no human relationship can compare with it is it any wonder that humanity has worshiped and tried to propitiate this maternal mystery at the very heart of our lives is it any wonder that we have personified her prayed to her confessed our deeper secrets to her cried out in pain to her danced for her sung for her and wept before her hence the worship of god as mother is found in all ancient civilizations in egypt she was known as isis in babylon and assyria as ishtar in greece as demeter and in phrygia as cybele judaism and later on islam put an end to mother worship in the middle east 
Christianity repressed it at first, but later started to venerate the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. Unlike other countries, Bharat has a sacred geography. She's concerned, she herself is considered as a living goddess. She's known as Bharata Mata, Mother India. All Indians consider themselves to be children of this great mother. The whole of the subcontinent has been rendered sacred by the remains of the body of Sati, which has been scattered by Shiva through the length and breadth of this holy land. This country is a repository of the divine power of the mother. Every region in Bharat is dotted with sacred and holy places. Every village has its own goddess. The sacredness of the land, rather than the unity of its political setup, has been the force which has made Bharat into a unified nation. In India, the worship of the Divine Mother is also a cultural gift from the pre-Aryan times. It has an unbroken tradition right from those Vedic times. In the Vedas, there are a number of hymns addressed to the Devi. Much later, a whole body of literature known as the Tantras were written, dedicated solely to the worship and philosophy of the Divine Mother. The Sri Suktam found in the Rig Veda is the most ancient invocation to the goddess. In the Veda, she was known as Aditi, the great cosmic mother, infinite and indestructible, the origin of all manifestation, the primordial space. All effulgence originates from her, and therefore she's the mother of all solar deities. The divine mother Bhuvaneshwari created space so that all the things in the manifest world could come up. Similarly, the space of our consciousness is also created by Bhuvaneshwari, allowing us to manifest as individuals in the world in which we exist. On the level of creation, space has several levels of manifestation, which are in perfect harmony with the resonance of the subtle energies. For instance, in this physical, physical space that is around us, there is also mental space, which is as infinite as physical space. The mental space also has several levels of subtlety, culminating the supreme space of the pure consciousness, which is beyond all manifestations. All these different types of space represent the various aspects and functions of Devi Bhuvaneshwari. The whole macrocosm is contained in the small, subtle space at the level of our own hearts. In other words, the, our hearts is the Bhuvaneshwari's residence. Because she represents space, Bhuvaneshwari is complementary to Kali, who represents time. These two goddesses represent the two main faces of the goddess, space and time, infinity and eternity. Kali creates events in time, and Bhuvaneshwari creates the objects in space. In other words, we may say that Bhuvaneshwari creates a stage on which Kali performs a dance of life and death. She is both the witness and the enjoyer of Kali's dance. The deep understanding of these aspects is that all events represent nothing but sequences in the Divine Mother Kali's consciousness as time, and all locations in space are in resonance with the Divine Mother Bhuvaneshwari, who represents space. Since she represents space, Bhuvaneshwari is connected to the cardinal points of north, south, east, west, northeast, southeast, and so on. Similarly, Kali creates all what we call the three derivatives of time, which are past, present, and future. The tantric spiritual tradition emphasizes the fact that space is mysteriously connected with time. They knew this long before the West discovered this. The spatial direction east represents the beginning of an action. North represents spiritual illumination. West is correlated to experience of this life and the process of spiritual maturity, and South represents the fullness, fullness of spiritual rea realization. Amongst the Puranas, it is the Devi Bhagavatam that deals with the concept of the ultimate reality in the form of the Divine Mother. It is ca classified as a Mahapurana. The Devi is beyond attributes, eternal and omnipresent. She is formless and immutable, but for the sake of the world, she assumes the forms of many shaktis. The Devi Bhagavatam has 18,000 slokas and is divided into 12 books. In the earliest literary work in which 
the character. In fact, it, it is the earliest literary work in which the character of the goddess stands fully revealed. Even though today she is conceived as she's pictured in this scripture. Obviously, this Purana depicts the ultimate reality as feminine. The origin of the world, according to Devi Bhagavadam, differs from other Puranas, since the Devi is the supreme power and creator of the cosmos. She herself describes the process of creation to the creator, Brahma. She is Mahadevi, Mahamaya, Mahapragati, and Maha Shakti. She is also Lakshmi, Saraswati, Parvati, Durga, Kali, Chandi, Bhuvaneshwari, and a host of other powers which are depicted in the Purana as different goddesses. The Dasha Mahavidyas are the forms that Sati took when Shiva tried to stop her from attending her father Daksha's Yaga. They guarded the ten directions and allowing, allowed Sati to walk freely. Actually, they are only all different forms of Kali. These ten Mahavidyas are called Bhadrakali, Svashanatara, Tripura Sundari, Bhuvaneshwari, Chinnamasta, Bhairavi, Dhumavadi, Bhagalamukhi, Matangi, and Kamala. The identification of the Devi's body with the different parts of the world has been given in this Purana. The earth is her loins, the oceans her bowels, the mountains her bones, the rivers her veins, and, and the trees the hair on her body. The sun and moon are her eyes, and in the other world her hips, legs, and feet. She wears the stars and ornaments in her eye, in her hair, and the crescent moon also in her hair. This Purana also describes her as the mother of the Trinity, the three, th three dynamic manifestations of the Absolute as Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara. They are all manifestations of Adi Shakti, or the first force. As Brahma Shakti, she manifests to us in the form of Saraswati. This is her Rajasic aspect. As Vishnu Shakti, she manifests in the form of Lakshmi, which is her which is her, which is her sattvic aspect. And as Shiva Shakti, she manifests in the form of Durvaga, which is her tamasic aspect. These are not three distinct devis, but the one energy of the Brahman, worshipped in three different manifestations. She is the creator of all the worlds and universes. Numerous Brahmas, Vishnus, and Shivas have emanated from her. The monastic systems of Hindu philosophy, like Vedanta and Yoga, are responsible for giving the general impression that Hindus look down upon wealth and give it a secondary importance in their social structure. But the contrary is the truth. Actually, the four Purusharthas, which are Dharma, Artha, Dharmartha, Kama, and Moksha, Artha is the second one, which, is, which means the desire, the human desire, to possess all types of wealth is contained in Artha. And Lakshmi, or Shri, as she was in initially known, has been revered from Rig Vedic times to the present day. Only by appreciating the true nature of Lakshmi can one hope to attain moksha or liberation, which is the goal of all Hindu philosophy. Initially, the two words, Shri and Lakshmi, meant everything that was auspicious and brought good luck or bestowed riches. Now, riches does not mean just um, money. It means the wealth of happiness, of auspiciousness, of everything that brings us happiness in this world actually belongs to Lakshmi's power. Just as the word Om is associated with the spiritual side of life, the word Shri is associated with the material side. It is a sacred symbol of cosmic auspiciousness and abundance in Vedic times. So it was but a natural that the two words eventually became connected and Lakshmi, the goddess of beauty and prosperity, came to be known as Sri Lakshmi. Maha Saraswati is the divine mother's power of intelligence, perfection, order, all scientific, all scientific knowledge streams only from her. Maha Kali derives all before her with her energy and force. Mahalakshmi points out the beauty of the rhythms and harmony of the world. Mahasaraswati provides the intelligence which details their organization 
and execution and allows us to have a glimpse into the nature of the scientific depths in, by which this cosmos has been created. During the nine days of Navaratri, or worship of the goddess, in her many forms, the first three days are normally devoted to Mahakali because she is the one who roots out our negative qualities, which is very necessary before we can enter into a spiritual life. So she is, she is, she is invincible and she does not brook any sort of uh, indulgence or any sort of uh, laziness. So we beg her to root out all our negative qualities first. The next three days are, are meant for the worship of Mahalakshmi, who plants in us the beauty and, and, and virtue, because only in a, in a garden which has been rooted out of all the re weeds can we sow any sort of seeds. And therefore, after rooting out the negativity by Mahakali, we, we, we invoke Mahalakshmi to plant the seeds of beauty and prosperity and, and abundance in, in our lives. And the final three days are devoted to Maha Swaraswati, who finally gives us liberation. Because in this garden, which has been cleaned out by Kakali, in which the plants of prosperity, prosperity and auspiciousness have been planted by Lakshmi, only in such a garden can the flower of, of, of uh, liberation, flower of blossom of um, uh, liberation and spirituality bloom, which is given by Maha Saraswati. Each of these nine days are also kept for the worship of the, of the one of the Navadurgas, who are already forms of Parvati. These Navadurgas are Shailaputri, Brahmacharini, Chandraganta, Kushmanda, Skandamata, Kartyaini, Kalaratri, Mahagauri, and Siddhidatri, who eventually gives us liberation. Saraswati's symbols and character contrast dramatically with those of Lakshmi. Saraswati is clad in pure white and Lakshmi in red. Saraswati's only ornament is a pearl necklace or one of crystal, pure crystal, while Lakshmi bedecks herself with numerous jewels. Saraswati holds books, pens and books and a veena in her hand, while Lakshmi holds lotuses and pictures of plenty. Saraswati is associated with the wind, free and unbound, and thus she rides with a, on a swan. Lakshmi is seated on a lotus and is associated with the earth and water, bound as well as flowing. Saraswati is associated with Brahma, a god who is never worshipped. And Lakshmi is a consort of Narayana, whose avatars are worshipped by all. Lakshmi's colour is that of turmeric and gold, while Saraswati is fair as a full moon. In the Veda, she was worshipped as a river. Her name actually means watery. This river was considered most sacred by all the early Indians. She held the same position then as Ganga does today. Ganga is actually the prototype of all the rivers in India. Her magic power of salvation is shared by all the waters of this land, though to a lesser degree. In the aspects of all power, the mother has a dual aspect. One as a vidya, cosmic delusion, and also that of vidya, or cosmic deliverance. She binds us with a bewildering maya of cosmic illusion in this world play of birth, death, and enjoyment. On the other hand, it is she who releases us from this wheel of existence. Artists have depicted her as holding a noose in one hand with which she binds us and a sword in the other hand with which she cuts the knot. Another beautiful imagery is that of the Indian kite game which is a game that all children play. The kite stand for souls in bondage. The mother also plays this game. The thread which holds her kite has sharp bits of glass in it. And as the kite soar up in the air, she cuts the thread with some of them, of some of them, and re releases them from bondage. In both these aspects, as the deluder and the releaser, she has set up this cosmic drama. She is the one who has brought about this amazing play of duality on the stage of the universe. Sri Ramakrishna gives another beautiful allegory. As long as a child is playing with toys, the mother, mother busies herself with household tasks. But when the child throws away the toys and cries for the mother, she puts down the cooking pot and runs to the child. 
This analogy illustrates the strong bond that exists between the divine conceived as mother and the devotee. Now let us look at the way Sankhya, Sankhya has described the relationship of Purusha and Prakriti. The Purusha is incon inconceivable supreme being, the transcendental Parabrahman. However, everything that we can think of or experience is the form of a Shakti, a Prakriti, or Goddess. That which we know through our mind and senses is nothing but the manifestation of the Mother. But she has a transcendental aspect as well. She is not contained in this little universe of which the earth is a very, very small, very infinitely small part, with its countless stars, a sun and a moon and all the terrestrial and stellar lunar and solar systems. Or all this is but an, as I said, just a speck in her vastness and infinity. Innumerable, innumerable such universes have their rise and fall with an eternal nature. She is all power and all manifestation through eternity and infinity. In her transcendental aspect, she is Parabrahma Swarubhini, the form of the absolute Brahman. Therefore, when we worship the Divine Mother, we are not only offering adorations to the Supreme in its maternal aspect, but also worshipping the Parabrahman. She is that aspect of the Supreme Power by whose grace alone we shall be ultimately released from the darkness of ignorance and the bondage of Maya and taken to the abode of knowledge, immortality and bliss. Prakriti and Purusha have no beginning and therefore no end. Purusha is a universal consciousness that exists in everything. This is the highest self. It is nirguna or without qualities. Shakti is the energy of the highest self and is inseparable from it. No human being can know the essence of this union, even by the study of the scriptures or the Vedas. All jivas are the products of the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, which is her game. They can never know that which is durguna or beyond the gunas. The gunas spring from the cosmic ahankara or ego. And unless one is totally free of ahankara or ego, one cannot ascertain the nature of purusha and prakriti. There is no difference actually between the Devi and the purusha or the Brahman, who is the supreme, from which everything emanates. Before creation, she lies related to the supreme undifferentiated consciousness of the Brahma. All creation has, done, has been done through the Shakti of the Purusha, which is always depicted as feminine. Shakti is a force which underlies and impels creation. To make a difference between force and the receptacle of force is an error. Prakriti is the inherent tendency of the Purusha to express himself in concrete forms and individual different types of being. However, she has to be set in motion by the will of the Purusha and acts according to his will and design. It is only through this Shakti or Prakriti that he is able to express himself in creation. The whole of creation is thus an idea in the mind of the Supreme. This idea is given a concrete reality and expressed in the world by his Shakti or Prakriti, which is itself with the Mahadevi or the great goddess. <coughs> Without her, he would remain <clears throat> aloof, inert, passive, and inactive. Prakriti is absolutely necessary of creation. It is only through her that the Purusha can manifest his full potential in creation. Without her, there would be no creation. Therefore, we can say that Prakriti not only complements the Purusha, but also completes him. Yeah. Many beautiful allegories are given by the Purana to give us an idea of this interdependence of Purusha and Prakriti. He is the supreme subject and she is the essence of all objects. He is the ocean and she is the waves. He is the sun and she is the light. He is the sky and she is the earth. She is all qualities and he is the enjoyer of all qualities. She is all activity and he the sole witness of all this action. She is the form of everything in the cosmos and he the thinker of the forms. She is speech, and he the meaning. In other words, she is creation, and he is the creator.
In Hinduism, creation is cyclic in nature. It is not a straight line as found in Western philosophy. A vast period of creation is followed by a vast period of resolution. There is no absolute beginning for a creation at any point of time, and therefore no absolute end. Because after all, what is the beginning or an end of a, of a circle? Time is not linear as in Western philosophy, but cyclic, as I said. A period of evolution is followed by a period of involution called Mahapralaya, in which all things remain in a latent state. At the time of Mahapralaya, or the great deluge, everything in the cosmos is taken back into the primeval essence. After the passage of eons, when the time is ripe for another creation, the one eternal Brahman takes on the quality or form of duality, just as one face becomes many when reflected in many mirrors. Mahamaya is the Lord's power of illusion or differentiation that creates the illusion of time, space, and causality. Desha, Kala and Nimitta. At the commencement of a new period of evolution, Mahamaya sets into being the process of evolution by which all things come into existence once again. Remember, nothing is created anew. Everything, like the seeds of grass on the ground, are lying latent in that pralaya itself and comes into being as when the time comes. During pralaya, the universe is in a is a state of latency, and after pralaya, it comes into a state of manifestation. It never gets totally destroyed. This is all the play or leela of the Mahamaya. She, the Mahamaya, is herself the revelation, the incarnation of the divine energy of the absolute. Life with all its dualities, its extremes of peace and strife, of dread and bliss, of heat and gold, holy and divine, is only a screen for the divine within it. Beneath the veil of Maya, the magic mirage, mirage of the universe, dwells the supreme spirit. The energy of Maya is nothing but the energy of that spirit. The Mahadevi emerges in the forefront, masking the absolute, but also displaying his true potentialities. Maya is the enchantress that makes us believe in the reality of this dualistic world which is only a veil for the non-dual reality of the Brahman. She is what produces this extraordinary universe, both personal and collective, as experienced by us within our limited, individualized consciousness, both when we are awake and asleep, remembering and forgetting, enjoying and suffering, always grasping for that which is ephemeral and unable to grasp the reality of its own existence. This is the paradox of Maya. Maya is the external gar garb of the universe. She is like a well-dressed, heavily made-up woman who appears beautiful and enticing. It is only when you remove her makeup that you discover her real form. The green color and sour taste of a fruit is not its permanent state. Soon it will become yellow, ripe and sweet. So the green state is an impermanent one. So also is the case with Maya. Her external garb is made up of the three gunas or qualities of primordial matter, sattva, rajas, and tamas. It is only when you strip her of these adjuncts that you see her beauteous form as Mahadevi. Thus, Maya is the continuous self-manifestation and self-disguise of the Brahman, its self-revelation as well as its concealing mask. Hence, everything in the universe is divine. Nothing can be scorned or cast aside as below power and worthy of contempt. Mahamaya herself is the sum total of all and is worshipped as the mother and life energy of even the gods as well as all creatures. The necessity for creation is because of the karmas which have been acquired by the devas during their sojourn on the earth. The causal body or antakarana of every embodied soul or jiva consists of the mind, intellect, and ego. And this bundle of thoughts and desires continue to exist on the astral plane even after the death of the body. It waits for an opportunity to take birth in a physical body in order to exhaust its desires. Hence, creation takes place 
due to the karmas of the jivas who are lying latent in the causal waters. Brahman is the cause of everything. Without Brahman, Maya could not exist. Therefore, Maya or Prakriti rests in its root cause, which is Brahman. Though they are one in a sense, during creation, differences are conceived. When everything melts and goes back to its original causal state, then there is no difference between Purusha and Prakriti, Maya and Brahman. There is neither male nor female. There is only Brahman with Maya left into it. The Sankhya philosophy de depicts as Prakriti and the Supreme Divine as the Purusha. Prakriti is unconscious activity, while Purusha is conscious inactivity. She is a Sakti or power of the Purusha that creates this enchanting and, and, and endearing universe. In fact, we can say that Prakriti is a playground of the Purusha. <clears throat> On the background of eternity, the drama on the stage of space and time is as insubstantial as the play of light and shade when the clouds move across the and, um, and make shadows um, of the sun. They are all creations of the mist of the mind which pass, flow, and vanish into thin air. The true work of Maya is a production of a phenomenal world which has its basis in nescience or avidya. Ignorance is the basis of this world that we experience. The universe, as well as our own personality, is as real or as unreal as the dualities, which seem to emerge from the supreme center and which are ignored by it. Maya coexists with Brahman. The yogi should concentrate on this truth and realize that the individual personality is one with the universal self, who is none other than Maha Maya herself. That which is mortal in us is also that which is imperishable. What is change and what is above change is one and the same. Thus the yogi should learn to accept the Maya of his frail, transient existence as the dynamic radiation of that eternal, absolute self. In the Shiva Purana, she is known as Shakti, since her projection of this universe is dynamic. Shakti is the energy that emanates spontaneously from the Supreme. Pure energy in any form is very dangerous if not controlled. In Tantric philosophy, it is Shiva who controls and conditions Shakti. He is the male aspect of the Supreme Brahman. He is depicted as having three eyes. Maya is his Shakti and contains the essence of duality which is space, time, and causation. <clears throat> Desha, Kala, and Nimitta. As long as Shiva keeps his third eye closed, Maya can have full play. Shiva's two eyes like ours see only duality. And when he keeps them open, the whole world of creation exists as we know it. However, when his third eye, the eye of transcendental wisdom, opens, he can see only unity. So when he opens his third eye, the cosmos, which can exist only in duality, along with his creatrix Mahamaya, will return back to the plane from which it was projected. As long as Shiva's third eye remains closed, nothing can exist. I'm sorry, as long as his third eye opens, remains open, nothing can really exist. There is only pralaya, or the undifferentiated consciousness of absolute reality. When he closes his third eye, Shiva becomes subject to duality once again, and Mahamaya appears in the forefront, and the cosmos rises up. One who has become fed up with this vain and futile running about in the game of the world has only to turn to her and beg her to release her from it. She will do it if I desire strong enough. Her grace is infinite. Her compassion love for all human beings, and especially for true seekers, is indescribable. It is true that she is the one who has set up this momentary play, this divine drama upon the stage of this physical universe. But she is ever ready to take back into her loving bosom those children who have lost interest in the play and have had enough. The child who has wandered far away from the mother one day realizes 
that she is the only source of security and runs back to her and begs her to take him back into her arms. The mother opens her arms wide and the errant child jumps into it and regains his original blissful state. Hence, let us ask her to forgive our mistakes and take us back into her loving arms, for she alone can remove her own veil of Maya and reveal the divinity behind. Sarva Mangala Mangale, Shive Sarvata Sadige, Sharane Taimbage Gauri, Nara Yani Namostode. I bow to Devi Narayani, the most auspicious one, who is the consort of Shiva and who can accomplish everything. Sharanagada Dinata Paritana Parayane, Sarvasyati Hare Devi, Nara Yani Namostode. I bow to Devi Narayani, who protects all devotees and removes their suffering. May she bless all those who are present here today and deliver them from diseases and confer the highest spiritual blessing on all of them. Hari Om Tatsu. Om Jai Shri Now if you have any questions, we can maybe go to, into the questions. Thank you so much, Maji. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few questions here. So can I just go ahead with the questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So one of I'm them is sure. during Navratri, Mother Goddess is worshipped in nine forms uh, as Ma, Shailaputri, Ma, Brahmacharani, etc. But in South India, this custom is not prevalent. Why? In North India had a lot of um, different, you know, many, many different types of ideas and uh, things were projected into the North by the, so many different conquerors which came into her. So there are actually, uh, there is many differences in the way the North and the South regard and even, and also you'll find that Navaratri is more prevalent in the North than even in the South. And so there are different forms of uh, also in the, in the Navaratri days, that is, she can either be worshipped in the nine forms of the goddess, or she can be, as I said, three days. First three days are devoted to uh, uh, Maha, Maha Kali, who removes our uh, uh, negativity. Next three days to Mahalakshmi, who uh, sows in us all the divine and beautiful uh, seeds of, uh, of um, pure essence of that of God. And finally, in that such a it's a place that only there that Mahasarasti will come only into the garden of that heart and hearts which have been cleaned of, of weeds and have been planted with the the seeds of uh, auspiciousness by Lakshmi. So this is the main way that we in the south have always done. But as I said, the idea of the Navadurgas, I think it was already there. The the Navadurgas are mentioned in the Devi Purana, but somehow it did not come into such prominence as it has lately. Lately, I find there is a big outburst of this uh, idea of the not only the Navadurgas, but also of the Maha, Dasha, Dasha Mahavidyas also, that they've also come into province suddenly. Uh, maybe because uh, a lot of our ideas, original ideas were suppressed by these foreign conquerors, as I said. But now that we have freedom to, to uh, look, look into our own, uh, into our own uh, amazing amount of literature we have on the Mother Goddess, all these different various sites of the Goddess have come once again into prominence. Thank you, Maji. Um, so the next question is, which form of the mother is the most sublime? Who should we pray to for feminine power? Feminine power, no doubt, is Durga. <laughs> Durga is the one who is depicted in the, uh, the uh, Chandipat as uh, the, a goddess which needs no support from any uh, masculine power. She is, stands solitary in herself because... Um, all the other gods gave their powers over to her and created her out of that. So she she's a she's a real amazing symbol of feminine uh, power, which we can easily emulate. But then, as I said, she is a very strong woman. But then also she's very beautiful and she's very kind and compassionate also. But Durga is the one which is the most powerful of all the goddesses because she does not lean on any masculine. God to get derive her power from. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, and Ma Kali is often shown standing with her right foot on Shiva's chest. What is the significance of this? The fact is that she is trying to prove that without her, she, he cannot create anything of this uh, manifest world. She is the creatrix, really speaking, because she is the one who gives us this play of uh, light and shade and beauty and darkness and all these things which we see and enjoy with our, uh, every day in the world. Because of her only, he can, he can create. Otherwise, he, he's supine. He's, he's, he's just a witness. He's just, uh, you know, nothing at all without his Shakti. That's why they call Shiva Shakti. And also, uh, always you'd find that the name of the Shakti is always placed before. Radha Krishna, uh, Lakshmi Narayana, <laughs> Gauri Shankar, and so on. Always the Shakti is kept before the, the male uh, protagonist. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, the chick inside the egg is already dependent on mother's energy. Then why is there a need to surrender? We are in the cosmic egg or the Brahmanda. We are already dependent upon our divine mother's grace and energy. So it's more of a dependence on the mother's energy, I think. That's a question. So what is it? What, what is the question? Why is there a need to surrender? The fact is that and surrender, this you're talking about a surrender which is unconscious. Unconsciously, we are in her in her bosom. Unconsciously, we are in the Brahmanda. Unconsciously, we perform all these actions. But when that unconscious state becomes conscious, when we become conscious of that power and Shakti which is igniting us, which is pushing us forward ever, ever, ever forward, when we become conscious of that, then we, we have to surrender. Only such a mind can surrender because an ignorant mind, what surrender can it have? It's filled with ego. I am everything. It's the Asuric ego, which thinks it can perform anything, can do anything. That is the state we are all in. But when we realize that actually we are impotent without that Shakti, when we realize that, when we become conscious of that, then we realize that we have to surrender to her. Only then, only if we smash that ego can we have realized the beauty and joy of actually living in her arms. Now we are like any animal. We are all supported by her. We are all supported. But does the fish ever know that it's being supported by the waters? <laughs> Once it realizes that it does, then it start, it will start worshipping that water because it knows that without that water it can never exist. So it's realization before surrendering. And it's the, yes, the consciousness. Yeah, it's we must con consciously know it. We are yes. unconsciously, we are all enjoying our power. Of course we are. Mm -hmm. But who's conscious of it? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Thank you. Um, so uh Mother G, you know, when it comes to uh, Puranas, you know, the main Puranas that we always talk about, which is the Mahabharata and Ramayana, they all revolve around male men, Rama, Krishna, but uh, Devi Bhagavatam did not gain prominence, you know, in all these years, even now, even when we are faced, even when we have a resurgence of Sanatana Dharma, why do you think that is? Well, of course, we live in a male-oriented, <laughs> dominated society. So perhaps that was one of the reasons. But the Shakti part, I mean, the Chand Chandi part is very, very famous. That is the, 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 the which every, every, everybody knows, which, which have been, uh, the verses which have been recited from the Yadevi, Sarva Bodeshu, Sarva Madhuryu, Bhenadu, Samsada, all these uh, verses, they all come from the uh, Chandi part. That is uh, the Devi Bhagavatam, which, uh, which is very, very commonly read all over, which is part of our tradition. And of course, the Lalita Sasranama again is recited by most people, all, all Hindus, uh, especially women, always recited the Lalita Sasranama as well as the Vishnu Sasranama, of course. But the Lalita Sasranama equal importance. And so I, I don't think it was um, exactly, of course, the poor males, they have to be given some, uh, some this thing. <laughs> and they did actually, you know, Rama was a great, uh, amazing Dharmic figure. So it actually has to have prominence in uh, the Ramayana. But that does not mean that Sita was left out. She was an amazing woman. She was an amazing power to have left. A princess was left. And that she's brought her to prominence. While Miki brings her to great prominence. There's no doubt about that, but we can't leave out drama because we want to give prominence to Sita after all. 
And same in the Mahabharata. What about Draupadi? She was the crown, crowning figure in the whole of the Mahabharata, I would say. All the great women, Kunti, Gandhari, all the great women in the Mahabharata, they, they stand out with such a strong personality. Without them, the Mahabharata, the whole Mahabharata would never have been written, I would say. So it's not correct to say that they were not, that they were left out. They were very much there because from Vedic times, the women have been given great prominence. It's only after the advent of the Muslims, because then they, the, the women took a back, background, came to the background, because mainly to protect the women, actually. They did not want them to expose uh, them into the, into, um, the, the eyes of the invaders. Mm -hmm. Actually, my uh, um, blog, I don't know any following the Adiveda, uh, you know, Substack blogs. Tomorrow's blog is on um, myths about mens menstruation, you know, which <laughs> brings out the why this it was such a uh, supposed taboo on, on something which is some very, very normal. So that brings out that very well. <laughs> so I thought it was a good blog to put uh, on, on this day. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. Uh, Mataji, I've been a reader of your blog all along and I love them. And it's been very educative and it kind of inspires me to learn new things too. So I'm strongly advising anyone who's interested to please uh, read that blog as well. So it's it's great. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. Um, mm -hmm. So there is another question, Mataji. Which form of mother should a householder pray to for spiritual awareness? Householders normally do pray to Lakshmi because they all they need some wealth. The household is the one who supports the whole of society. Other people like sannyasis, brahmacharis and all that are not supposed to acquire wealth. They depend on the householder. So householder definitely has to give a prominent place to Lakshmi. But if he wants to get spiritual power also, of course, I, Saraswati is the one he should pray to. And more than anything else, you don't have to make such clean cut divisions. These divisions were made only to support the, the uh, paucity of our minds to think of, of our all and concussing figure. We could not, we can't, we can't really think of that. Just like we cannot think of Brahman. Our mind is limited. So these divisions were made because of that. But remember, your best form, if you want a household, I would definitely say you should also uh, have a Sri Yantra in the house. A Sri Yantra to which a little bit of, you know, um, Kungamarchana can be done with just this Om Shri Matre Namaha, Om Shri Matre Namaha, which is invokes her power as the Divine Mother, by which naturally he, he and his family will be uh, nourished and nurtured and taken care of. At the end of the day, it's a universal energy that we are praying to form us in our minds, right? Exactly. That, All yeah. these forms are only the universal energy or the Shakti of the Lord. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and in front of a Divine Mother, we are her children. Children are always pure. But then why do the saints say that we do have to purify no, no, you will, that, that is that uh, on myth about menstruation, you must read that because that gives it very clearly. It is not, it was never said in that. In fact, the women are supposed to be the forms of the goddess. Even today in villages, you will find the, the um, uh, Devi attached to everything. She's Lakshmi Devi, Saraswati Devi, or Kanta Devi, or um, uh, Chinna Devi, or some other this thing, all odd names, but at the end it'll be written Devi. And if you, if you call them, ah, Shanta, no, 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 no Shanta Devi hai mein. <laughs> they will correct you. Because all, uh, all women are considered as forms of the goddess. So it's not, it's, it's, it, this sort of thing was only a Western concept, really. We never had that concept. The woman was always given a very prominent place in a, in a, in a society. Yeah, it's time for us to reclaim that, especially on an International Women's Day, we can start working on that, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. I don't think we have to reclaim it. We, so we reclaim something which we have lost. We have not lost it. It's still with us. We yeah. just have to bring it out into prominence, that's all. And you see that everywhere. Women are most prominent in everywhere in all societies. They're slowly coming. Indian society has always been like that. 
It's always been, though masked by the a lot of um, by the in in the number of invasions and invaders we've had. It's like mm -hmm. Victorian uh, in India was become so prudish <laughs> that we were forced to accept these Victorian ideas, which, which we never had. We never had it. In mm -hmm. South India, for instance, we never covered our heads also. In North India, they all cover their heads. Why? Because of the invasions, which makes them feel that, that you know, that they should be covered decently or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they yeah. did not expose themselves to these eyes, you know, foreign eyes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marji. That is the end of our questions here. Um, is there anything else you would like to add before we, before, if you would like to chant the concluding prayer? Well, <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you to have asked me on this day. It was actually quite a feat to do it at this time because uh, yesterday we were up half the night, as you know, Mahashivaratri night yesterday. <laughs> so there were a lot of people and we had a lot of pujas and so on. And we went to, went to sleep quite late, which is good, of course. That's what we're supposed to do. But not when you have to jump up in the <laughs> and, again and finish the puja and then take at 6.30. And to, of course, to, of course, lot, so many little um, tests are there. That's why the video didn't work and mm -hmm. so on. But anyway, it all worked out fine. I was sure it would work out fine. It was all the way she has of teasing us and making yeah. us well, to, to see whether we lose our cool, as you say. Right. So it was very beautiful. Thank you so much. And I'm yeah. so grateful. No, and thank all you my so much, Maji. Your, yeah. All my blessings on your uh, community. I'm thank so happy to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Om Sarve Sham Swastir Bhavatu Sarve Sham Shantir Bhavatu Sarve Sham Purnam Bhavatu Sarve Sham Mangalam Bhavatu Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bajani Pashantu Makas Chitukabha Om Shanti 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 Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loga samasta sukhino bhavantu hari om that's it thank you very much maji um, was fantastic to have you and once again thank you okay. hari om hari om <laughs>